Showing versus telling. In this lecture, I'm going to explain to you one of the most fundamental principles of good creative writing, how to show with your words. What is showing? Showing is the art of describing a scene, moment, person, idea, or concept using only descriptive words rather than explanatory words. There is a difference. Descriptive words are words that no one can reasonably argue with. Whereas explanatory words are words that can have a variety of different meanings depending on the reader or the listener hearing them. When you want to show something to a reader, you need to use words that are objective, not subjective. For example, look at this apple. If I were telling, I would say, there was an apple on the table. The reader then imagines whatever apple he or she can conjure up. But is it this apple? Or is it this one? Or this one? Or this one? Or this one? Do these apples look the same to you, or are they different? If I really want to show the first apple, I have a lot more work to do than just to say, there was an apple. I'd have to describe its basic shape, the color pattern, the location of the stem in relation to the rest of the apple, the shine on the surface, the freckles of red in the green part, the little droplets of dew or water on the outside. I have a lot more work to do in order to show this apple is an individual. Don't confuse it with all these other apples on the screen, reader. See this first apple. That's the apple I need you to see. In other words, you want to imagine that you are describing your poetic image or fictional scene to a police sketch artist. Would she be able to draw a picture of what you are describing? And would that picture be clear enough to lead the police to the criminal? Or would it be so vague as to create a wanted poster that looks like any old guy off the street? Let's try an experiment. I want you to draw me two pictures. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to pause this video and then resume playing it after you've completed a quick task. The task is this. Get out a sheet of paper and a pencil and get ready to draw a picture. Go ahead and pause this video now. Great. Got your paper and pencil ready? Let's begin. The first picture I want you to draw is this. The world's ugliest baby. Now go ahead, start drawing. You don't need more than 60 seconds or so to draw this picture. You may pause the video and resume when your picture is done. Go ahead and pause this video now until your drawing is complete. Excellent. Do you think you've really captured the essence of the world's ugliest baby? Well, here's the image I had in my head when I described it to you. Does your drawing look like this? Or does it look more like this? Or how about this little guy? Or did you interpret the word ugly in a completely different way, and rather than attribute it to appearance, you applied it to attitude, drawing a baby in an ugly mood like this little tyke? Do you think all of you who are watching this lesson drew the same picture? Why not? Didn't I use an adjective? Isn't world's ugliest a detail? Well, it is a detail, but it's an explanatory detail. It explains the idea rather than describes it. That's why we all have different pictures in our heads when we say the words, world's ugliest baby. There are no ugly babies. This was just a silly exercise. Now I want you to draw me another picture. Go ahead and get your paper and pencil ready. This time I want you to draw the following. A bird's eye view of a brown three-foot square table with a one-foot diameter spherical red rubber ball in the center. Go ahead and pause this video and resume it when your drawing is complete. Great. Do you have a drawing ready? Do you think you were able to draw a brown tabletop and a red rubber ball accurately? Does your tabletop look, look something like this? And the red rubber ball looks something like this? Why do you suppose it was so much easier to draw the second picture? Was it because it's simpler? No, I promise it's not that. In fact, look at the difference in text available. The second image has a lot more text, which would make it fundamentally more complicated, don't you think? The reason you could draw this second image better was because I provided you with concrete descriptions rather than descriptions that can be interpreted. Now, you may think you've got a handle on the showing versus telling thing, so let me complicate things even further for you. Humans. Humans are, by nature, social creatures and we learn at a very young age how to interpret a person's facial expression and body language. The trouble is, we're not always right and when we describe people to one another, we often insert our interpretation rather than our observation. Let's apply this theory to people. Look at the image on your left. How would you show this? 
Is your first impulse to describe the young girl as surprised or excited or alert? If so, you've fallen into the trap of interpreting your characters for the reader. Very few people like to be told what to do, and even fewer people like to be told how to think. When we interpret things for our readers, we deprive them of the ability to think for themselves. Now look at this image again. What do you really see? Not what you interpret or think you see, but what do you really see? Draped in a thick white sheet, the eight-year-old girl sat upright at the front of the swivel salon chair, looking at her reflection in the oversized mirror. The stylist had pulled the girl's rust-colored locks into a samurai topknot as she prepared to comb the fringe of fine hair at the nape of the girl's neck. The girl's russet eyebrows rose up high on her head, and her pink mouth was as round as her eyes as she cooed at her reflection. Her hands were interlaced, white-knuckled and poised over her lap as she waited for her hair to be transformed by the black, pronged comb. Do you see the difference? In this description, nowhere do I plant an emotion on this little girl. Instead, I describe her appearance, what her body is doing, what her face and hands are doing, where she is, what she sees. This is observational. These are all things I can reasonably ascertain by looking at someone. Saying she is surprised or excited, however, are only guesses, and thus they are not actually reasonably ascertained. They're not showing, they're telling. So what does showing include? Well, spatial relationships, that is, defining how two different objects or characters are related to one another spatially. For instance, she sat so close to him that she could feel his breath on her neck color, like rust-colored or green, shapes, like circular, triangular, spherical, or round, size, but you must be specific. You can't say big because big is subjective, but you could say six inches tall or create a comparison, such as when she stood at her full height, her head came to his shoulders and his fingertips on his outstretched hand grazed the hanging net of the basketball hoop. Now you've got a really clear picture of how tall this gentleman is. Temperature. Again, you've got to be specific. You can't say it's cold because cold is different for Floridians than it is for Mainers. So instead you might say, it was so cold that the insides of my nose stuck together as I tried to breathe. Time, duration. Again, you have to be specific. You can't say it was a very long time, but you might say it lasted all of 30 seconds, but felt like 5 hours and 38 minutes to the little boy while he waited for the school bell to ring, singling the end of class. Sensory details are perhaps the gold standard of showing, and these would include textures, which sim symbolizes your sense of touch. Imagine, as I say, the boy felt what he could only imagine to be crunching fortune cookie shells beneath his shoes as he strode over the beetles in the dark. Or the rat's tail was striated like a straw covered with tiny rubber bands from top to bottom. Can you feel these sensations for yourself? Taste is self-explanatory, but be careful with how you demonstrate it. It's not enough to say it tasted like lobster if none of your readers have ha ever had lobster. You might say instead it was buttery and smooth with a hint of salt water as the spongy lobster meat rolled over the girl's tongue. Scent is the strongest trigger of memory. It can also be one of the strongest showing details. Consider what you conjure up in your mind when I say, I always loved going to my grandmother's house. I'd swing open the door and be greeted by the mixing aromas of cinnamon, flour dust, and lemon soap on the crisp kitchen air. Sound has some additional considerations. Like the other senses, you can create comparisons. The landing plane sounded like a pair of pots clanging together. But you also have a little more power with sound, particularly with onomatopoeia. This is the concept where the word actually represents what it sounds like. For instance, the basketball thwopped against the pavement, or the frog splished into the water. Lastly, a quick note about sound, dialogue. Dialogue in stories is an example of showing sound. No two people sound alike. The actual words they choose to say show who they are. Consider this. Scrap it, he yelled down to the boy. Scrap the whole darn thing. It's too messy, and you're getting too uppity about it, the boy responded. But why, father, shall I scrap the project when it has given me such pleasure to engage in this delightful pastime? See how dialogue can show you a character? Giving speech to characters is one of the best ways to show them in fiction. And lastly, analogies. I've already used some analogies to describe things in this list, but here's a final note about analogies. Consider your audience when creating them. For example, here in Maine, we pretty much all know what a frost heave is. If I were talking to someone from Southern California, though, they might not know, and I'd have to show it to them with my words. I might say this. 
A frost heave is when the snow melts in the winter sun, pools under the tar, and then freezes overnight, expanding to create a mound in the road that is very much like the speed bumps in a shopping mall parking lot. This created an analogy between frost heaves and speed bumps, something most Southern Californians are bound to recognize. We've covered showing. Now let's talk a moment about telling. I don't want you to think that all telling is bad. In fact, when we get to fiction, you'll quickly learn that you have to balance showing and telling in order to create something called pacing. Pacing is the general rhythm of a story where you move very quickly through some parts and slowly through others in order to create an emotional response in your readers. It is important then that we know what telling is. Telling is concepts. Concepts such as ugly or beautiful, or world peace or true love. It's explanations like her face looks that way because she's angry. It's emotions like he's surprised, delighted, or furious. It's interpretations like traffic was backed up for miles because nobody knows how to drive. It's adverbs such as saying she said quickly as opposed to saying she said. When I add the word click quickly there, I'm actually telling the reader how to interpret her action. And then, of course, cliches. Cliches are tired phrases that have been used so often no one knows what they mean anymore, like, it's around the corner. Well, how far is that really? In Presque Isle, around the corner might be something very different than in Portland, Maine. Cliches are so egregiously telling that we'll actually do a full exercise on them in this module. Just remember, telling a reader doesn't show a reader. This apple is so much more than an apple. Let's take an example that relates to your first showing exercise. This video is listed as in the Creative Commons license on YouTube, so I'm using it for educational purposes in my own video. Let's start with the telling as we watch it. I watched a soap bubble freeze, and then I watched that soap bubble pop. Now, let's do the same video over again, but this time we're going to show it. A soap bubble wobbled on the surface of some snow. In its iridescent surface, I watched the fingers of bare tree branches waver in the gelatinous movement of the purple-tinted orb. Glints of pink, green, and purple flickered as the gray cast wintry sunlight shone over it. Slowly, pocks of what looked like jellyfish began to form on the surface of the bubble, white and crystalline, until at last the bubble shattered into threads of whisper-thin snow and ice. See the difference? Now let's see if you can do it yourself. In the next exercise, showing with words, you'll have an opportunity to do just that.